Joan Agajanian Quinn, a member of the California Arts Committee, is the former West Coast editor of Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine and society editor of the Herald Examiner. Her cover stories are seen in Venice and Detour magazines, and she is a contributing editor to California Apparel News. For the next half hour, Joan will bring you inside news and views on society, art, film, and the exhilarating worlds of these multifaceted people. Here is Joan Quinn. Hi, welcome to Joan Quinn, etc. We're happy to be back. Our guests are Julia Andre Samuel and actress Joan Chen. When the Samuels opened Fred Joliet on Rodeo Drive several years ago, they were the first European jewelers to come to Beverly Hills. Fred is a successful family-owned operation with shops in Europe, the Far East, as well as the United States. We went to the Beverly Hills store recently to talk to Mr. Samuel about his precious stones and about his expertise with important pearls. Here's our talk with Mr. Samuel. Fred Joliet is truly French jewelry. We're not in France, but on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills with Henri Samuel, the son of the founder of Fred Joliet. I like the idea that Fred Joliet was born the same year as you, Henri. Welcome to Joan Quinn, etc. And tell us how that happened. The star was born, and you were born. Yeah, I think uh, my mother could not uh, attend the inauguration of the store because uh, I was just born a few days before. I Did don't recall it, but I've <laughs> been told it. <laughs> was it planned that way? Uh, I don't think you planned these situations, <laughs> but they happened. How long uh, had your father been in the jewelry business before he opened his own store? Well, my grandfather was already a jeweler. Mm. And uh, he was uh, born in France and uh, lived in the uh, South America and had two Jewish stores in Argentina in Buenos Aires. Oh, before they ever went to Fr before you, before the family went to France. And then he returned to France. And uh, my father uh, naturally went into this business uh, before he married my mother. Begin his own business in, in 1936. Tell us how the name, so that makes it 55 years old. Yes. Tell us how the name uh, came about. It's such a strange name to have the first name of someone on a jewelry store. Well, in 1936, he opened the store with his name, his full name, Fred Samuel. And because of the war, uh, he had to take his uh, second name, his name, out of the front of the store. And when he came back after the war, he just left it that way. So it's how it started in uh, 45 with the name of Fred. You were a pioneer in 1977 to come to Rodeo Drive. It was actually the beginning or before any of the other international um, shops had opened here. How did you have the foresight to come here? Well, we were told that uh, Beverly Hills was the place to be, and I came, and uh, I was taken by the ambiance. And I thought that I could understand the way of living here, and uh, I love, love it. And uh, this is how we started. Did you actually move here then when the shop opened? Well, at that time, uh, both myself and my brother lived here for about two years. Then. First, I did move here for a six month period to open the store, and then my brother stepped in for at least a year time. Did you always think you'd follow your father in the business? No. I, I came out of a, one of the best business schools in Paris. And my desire was to try to prove myself I could do something on my own. Uh, my father asked me to join him because he wanted to expand, and this is how I came into the business. It took me a while to, <laughs> to prove myself that I have done something to develop the business. One of the things that I know was uh, very close to your father were pearls. Do you feel the same way about pearls? I think he opened in 1937 with pearls as the main thrust yes, of what he was Yes, you have to go back to this year, <laughs> where, where uh, you were speaking of natural pearls. <laughs> That's what I'd like you to explain. Opposed to cultural pearls. Uh, and, uh, and 
entrepreneurs were difficult to uh, merge, to, to sell, because people saw that it was an artificial product. And if you know a little of what it means, uh, a pearl. Let's talk about, you want to talk, show us? Because these are incredible. Yes, these They're are. They're so incredible. big. What, how many millimeters would those be? These are about 15, 14 to 15 millimeters. And you have to understand that any pearl uh, are produced by an oyster. And natural pearl is an accident. It's a small inclusion that comes into the shell and that the uh, oyster swallow and to uh, react to the inclusion, she, uh, the oyster products the uh, pearl the, around it. So when it came to uh, culture pearl, it's, uh, it's it's the man who introduce a small bowl inside the oyster, and then the oyster produce the uh, pearl. But out of maybe uh, 10 inclusion, there is one which come out, and the other which are rejected, or oh, the oyster die. Oh, I so see. It's not so easy to produce. But this is, say, a man-made. A culture pearl is man-made. And well, it's, cut, it's, it's made by the oyster, but it has been uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the pearl has been made because the man has done something to the oyster right. to produce the pearl. And they come and, out white. And they come out white or they come. But so, what, how does this come out? Yeah, but just to go back <laughs> oh, to this okay. uh, situation, until, until the end of the uh, first war, let's say, before the, first, the Second War. Uh, the uh, pearl uh, were very small because the oyster that was producing the pearl was spacey, which could not produce large pearl. Then they find a new species in other waters that they call South Seas, mm -hmm. where they were able to produce larger pearl. This is where how this pearl came out, but they have a different color. They don't have the same, uh, you cannot, produce uh, this color, this pink, into this oyster. Oh, I see. And then, you're speaking of black pearls, this is, this is something which <coughs> is fairly new. Uh, <coughs> until uh, they found in Tahiti a oyster which naturally produced a black uh, pearl, uh, there was no black pearl nearly available only tinted pearl. And from now on, with the Tahiti production, there is a black pearls coming out, which are natural pearl. Oh, so those are just like, they would come out of the shell just like these would come yes, out of the, the shell. Well, that's, I see. So just to say that uh, the, the pearl is, is something where the valuation and, and the uh, price can there. vary from a thousand dollars like this necklace to seven hundred of thousand dollars. Seven hundred thousand? Yes. You could just have a range from anything. Yeah. Or it could just be fake too. <laughs> and you're a, a yachtsman and a golfer and I think you've taken some uh, position in the company to, to influence the design uh, with that Force 10. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, I've been, uh, as you say, a sportsman. Uh, I've been uh, for 25 years of my life involved in the international competition in your team. I've been in the French Olympic Committee. So, and my hobby has become part of my professional life when by accident we create a line of jewelry uh, with nautical cable and gold. So it's not, it's it's really cable with 18 karat gold. Yes, it's a real cable that uh, I used to use before to hoist myself. Oh, is that right? And yeah. then it, and you make glasses and watches. And, and from this on, we created a, a line of jewelry where sometimes we are more known as for stand than even as friend. I see. A new line that's just opened is called J'adore. And you've been married for more than 20 years to Beatrice, mm -hmm. 
who is a has a title. I want to ask you about that. Does that mean you have a title? I don't know what title she has. No, Can no, you I tell us? Yes, we just created a new line of jewelry because we saw that the experience we have done with uh, for STEM could be maybe duplicated. Uh, and Jador means? And, and uh, Jador means Jador, but... Uh, what does it mean in English? Tell us. <laughs> well, I think the English could understand Jador without explanation. It's uh, I love you, or in French, uh, it's... it's, a, it's a, we we uh, we begin this company in the U.S. with an ad where we say Jadot Fred he creates all my jewelry. Oh, I see. Uh, and uh, so this is how we uh, have uh, named this collection. And this collection is made of uh, a sign of recognition. It's uh, all made of small uh, gold balls, oh. which. Uh, we have been able to create a full line from rings, necklaces, uh, small animals, uh, etc. But when people are going to wear it, it will be recognizable. Recognizable that uh, this line, it's part of this line. It's the signature line of Fred. It's and a signature line which uh, has everything that you can imagine in, in, in a line of jewelry. And, uh, that is easy to wear, that we have introduced everywhere in the Japanese market, in the French market, in the US market. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems to be already uh, very uh, well received by our customers. Well, j'adore Fred, j'adore being here on Rodeo Drive. <laughs> I've enjoyed being with you. And I think the one thing that I really would love from Fred is this ivory, one of a kind fan. And uh, the next time it comes over from Paris, will you let us know so we can come over and see it? It's a pleasure. And thank you very much, Henri Samuel from Fred Joliet. It was exciting to be sitting there surrounded by all those gemstones. Thank goodness the guards were there. Here's this wonderful piece, the, uh, the fan with uh, all the diamonds and emeralds and rubies. And when we come back, we're going to be talking to actress Joan Chen, who was raised and born in China. I wonder if they ever used this fan at the Peking Opera. After the break, we'll find out. Joan, <laughs> did you use a fan like that? A used fan, but not like that. No, not that fancy, no. Were you, did, were you ever in the Peking Opera? Yes, we were trained. I mean, acting school, we had um, traditional dancing, traditional Peking Opera, and the Stanislavski. Yeah. But did people in the audience use fans as well? As the Everybody uses stage? fan. Everybody uses fans. I mean, fan is a big part of Chinese culture. Well, we're going to find out more about Chinese culture. Joan Chen is in the studio with us. She was born and raised in China. Her studies in China were basically in the academics and the arts. When she came to the U.S. in 1981, she left behind a stellar career in show business. She was more well known in Shanghai and Peking, and still is, than she was in the United States for her roles in The Last Emperor and Twin Peaks. Joan. How did your career take off here? How could you leave a career like that and then come here? What did you think you were going to do? Well, I left China um, for many reasons. Um, curiosity, because I felt um, I was on top of my career in China, and I felt anywhere I go would be going down, and I was <laughs> absolutely scared, and I was gaining a lot of weight. I was was getting a little fat. I said, no, 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 I don't want all my audience to see me getting fat. And, and also, very important thing is that I couldn't really continue studying in China.
because of the demand in movie studios and they just asked me to work. Uh, I'd like to go to school and they wanted me to work so um, I applied and go, uh, went to university here. That was really your your move here into America? Yeah. Was really to come to school? Yeah. yeah. What, I think when you were in China you did a lot of um, directing as well. Yeah, I studied directing, I directed on stage and um, I just felt very hollowed out. I felt very emptied out. You always like talk shows, I was always talking, right, being asked questions and also when you work you also just give a lot and didn't have enough chance to receive knowledge and to have enough chance to replenish my mind and I felt very empty and I wanted to go to school, I just wanted to take off and learn. How did you adjust to the lifestyle here of being a student and being a big star and coming from a very uh, uh, important family as well. I'm still adjusting. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not easy. It's how did you easy. live in China uh, as opposed to how you started living here? When I was in China, China back then was not at all materialistic. Um, everybody still wanted to excel, excel in profession, excel politically, wanted mm -hmm. to be on the right track. Um, and when I was back in China I always had to be like the example for all the young people so I had to do everything right and I never dated and I you know life is very rigid in that way um, and also we don't get paid a lot there but like all stars and all over the world people love you so you basically didn't need any money I never I never thought of money when I was in China. For like the queen, you never took your you, purse anywhere. No, you, you never <laughs> needed to pay, you know, it's always taken care of. And I never learned that I need to uh, um, pay rent. I needed to, you know, pay telephone bill because I never paid for anything. Ah. And after I came here, I all of a sudden had this pressure and it was enormous. That's the first learnings, like, okay, next month there's a bill, next month there's a bill and it was terrible. Also, you were living in a commune type of situation, I understand. Yes. Well, tell us a little bit about that and then tell us how you lived in a situation here that wasn't like that. Um, in acting school, I went to acting school when I was 13 and started working about that time. So we lived, um, the whole class lived together and oh. um, we started early, like 5.30 in the morning, we, have, we trained, like we had drills military training, physical training, and acting school, and then political training. And it was a very disciplined life. I had a routine. Um, and everything was paid for, take care of. You go to lunch, everybody eat together. And then on the set and going to do movies, everything was taken care of by the studio. On any other trips, it was all taken care of by the government. You know, so it was really like a commune a, mm -hmm. a life. You share everything. And, mm -hmm. I had to learn every new rule in here, you know. You bought a house? I bought a house, I own two cars, I actually own two houses, I have a house in San Francisco. How did you so. start, how did you actually say, oh, I'm going to get started now, I have to have a place to live, I can't live in, a, in this co cozy little atmosphere anymore? Yeah, um, in the dormitory when I first came, <laughs> I, I lived uh, more or less the same way, but then I realized, oh, I have to pay myself. You mean and at school, to, the dormitory school, at school? Dormitory. But, so I realized I had to work. So wow. I waited on tables, I worked in the library, I worked, took all the odd jobs that had nothing to do with <laughs> acting, and it was very, very difficult, because I never worked. I never worked in China like that, you know, just acting in school, that was all I did. And so it was good training, it, good training. it was hard on me, but it was, so you had to start from the bottom All after over. you were already at the top. What was your big break once you came to America? Um, I think it was uh, Taipan, the movie Taipan. Um, that was my first uh, feature film uh, in the United States. And it was just, I was walking through Lorimar parking lot and Dino De Laurentiis saw me and said, oh, I'm looking for a girl and it's you. <laughs> 
and it was just lucky. That was your big break then. Yeah. Were you trying? Were you yeah. auditioning? I was at auditioning Larmer? for some television at the same time going to school, and I thought it was a better way of supporting myself. I would do that better than waiting on tables. But I wasn't working much, and I, I wasn't really thinking of acting as something important. At that time, school was important. I was supporting myself, going through education. Um, but after Taipan, things seemed to get a lot better. And, and after Taipan, I was like, hmm, what am I going to do with all these money? It was, oh. They paid me very little. They paid me very little. But I was like, looking at the money, I said, that's a lot of money. What am I going to do with it? Oh, that was great. <laughs> and then you went on to The Last Emperor. Was that the next yes. role? Yes. And, and were you cast here in the United States or cast in China? Actually, I was studying directing at that time. I was about to graduate. And I heard, heard about the movie. I went to see um, uh, Bernardo. I Bertolucci. said, yeah, Bernardo, yeah, Bertolucci, yes. Um, I said, I want to be your assistant because I um. wanted to learn. I, I wanted to learn who was a better person, you know. And he looked at me. He said, No, 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 no. Uh, you're my empress, and that was that easy too. I mean, I often go to auditions and lose jobs, but whenever I'm not thinking about it, I would. Just, you know, Bernard just looked at me and said, okay, you're my empress. Well, how did, uh, did David Lynch look at you and say, you're my woman in charge of the mill? Yes. Yes? Yes, I didn't audition for that at all. I went in because I liked his work, and um, it was written for an Italian girl. This was for Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks, Lynch. yes. And um, I walked in, I said, I'm not Italian, but also eat noodle. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, mm, we can be open-minded, and just like that. That's great. Yeah. Now you're do you've been working a lot more since Twin Peaks. So there is life after Twin Peaks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Was it hard? Yes. Um, it's actually easier, I think. Twin Peaks, um, um, is well known all over the world and it helps me professionally yes yes you're you're just finished a new movie called turtle beach mm -hmm. and we have a clip do you want to tell us just a little bit about your character in the movie yes um, she is from vietnam and um, she like most women who escaped from vietnam went through a lot of hardship uh, she is very very tough very shattered and vulnerable inside, but very tough outside and uh, a survivor. And also she loves very deeply. Um, she was a prostitute in Vietnam and she had three children from different men. She loved them very much and she gave her life eventually for the three children. And the story also tells about love and about women and children and career. You know, most people in the West would feel, okay, I'm, I'm sacrificing because I'm having babies, mm -hmm. you know, and I have to sacrifice for my children, and they, they hinder my career, and this bitterness that comes with it sometimes. Or you feel it's a sacrifice, and to her, the character that played, Minu, it is not. I mean, she doesn't compartmentalize her life like this, and loving your children is natural. You're not sacrificing because, um, you would be sacrificing if you do your career and not take care of children mm -hmm. at the same time. So mm -hmm. it is also a sacrifice. So it's all together. And it tells a parent, um, tells parents love to their children and its difficulties. So, so who's um, also in the movie? Greta Skaki. So I think we'll see that uh, yes. clip yes. right now. Yes. An act of extreme sacrifice. Minu Hogde was the bravest person I've ever met. Two women from different worlds. One has all the questions. Why did you leave Saigon? I wasn't that keen on a bullet through the back of my head. The other has all the answers. There is corruption at all levels. In a world gone mad. The 
they form a special bond. Richard wants custody of my boys. I had three children once. I left them behind. Retta Skocki, a reporter on the story of her life. Try what you saw yesterday. I'll get it out of the country for you. Joan Chen, the ambassador's wife, struggling to escape her past. From Blanche Dabouge's best-selling novel of intrigue, deception... What are you hiding? ...and passion. Nobody else saw it, Richard. I have to follow it up. ...comes a movie about two extraordinary women and the risks they take to change their lives forever. Whatever happens, save my children, please. Joan, you talk so lovingly about giving up certain things in career and in life. Do you, will you be experiencing those? Do you feel um, uh, um, those things happening to you? Um, well, I don't see it as a uh, sacrifice. I see it as part of my life. I just got married and... Uh, Congratulations. <laughs> yes, thank you. To a doctor. Yes, yes. He's wonderful. And so uh, we live in San Francisco now, but I do keep my house here, and I have to fly back and forth. Um, and I will have babies, but I don't think it conflicts with the, you know, career and, and life. You got to live. You'll you have know? to address those things as yes. they come, and yes. and if you if you're looking at them the way you're looking at life now, yeah. I think you'll be able to. Uh, Solve everything. You're going to move away to San Francisco. Yeah, but and um, will you stay in Los Angeles a little bit? Yeah, I was thinking, you know, probably once a week, once a month, I'll travel back. One, you know, just to well, see be friends. Before you leave, quickly tell us what you like about Los Angeles. I, you know, it's very strange now. Now that I drive around Los Angeles, I start to have this reminiscent feeling. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, I'm leaving the city. Um, I think I, I like its lightness, and um, and it's very pretty at some places. The beach, the climate is nice, and I live on the hills. It's <clears throat> very romantic, very green, very beautiful, and friends. So, um, yeah. So you'll come back and see your friends, yes. and you'll come back and see us. Yes. Thanks very much, Joan Chen. And thanks for being with us on Joan Quinn, et cetera, and we'll see you next time.